family, I'm Jill Morricone. We welcome you to a brand new quarter of 3ABN Sabbath School panel. Last quarter, we studied The Great Controversy, written by Pastor Mark Findlay. This quarter, we study the book of Mark. This quarterly has been written by Dr. Tom Shepard, who's a senior research professor of New Testament at the Andrews Theological Seminary at Andrews University. He's been here at 3ABN before, an excellent student of the Word and we are looking forward to this journey through the Gospel of Mark. I want to introduce my family, your family, on the panel this week. To my left, Brother Ryan Day, so glad you're here. Amen. Always a blessing to be on 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I have Monday's lesson entitled, A Second Chance. Amen. In the middle, the lady in the lovely blue, Shelley Quinn. It's lovely to be back. Uh, I have Tuesday's message, which is the messenger. Mm, amen. Professor Daniel Perrin, looking all sharp in a black suit here. Thank you. I've got Wednesday's lesson, which is Jesus' baptism. Amen. Last but not least, Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Jill. I have Thursday's lesson, which is entitled, The Gospel According to Jesus. Amen. It's going to be a great study as we open up the Word of God. We want to encourage you, if you would like a copy of our notes, now the notes are going to come just as we prepare them. We all prepare notes in a different fashion, but we want to offer them, make them available to you if you would like. So you can email us, ssp at 3abn.org. That's ssp at 3abn.org, and we'd be delighted to send those notes over to you. Now, if you've already signed up, you don't have to sign up again. Once you're signed up, you are signed up and you're good. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Ryan, would you pray for us? Sure, absolutely. Our Father in heaven, Lord, as we take on this new quarter, this new lesson, Lord, in the book of Mark, I pray that you will lead and guide each and every one of us here on the panel uh, to represent you correctly, to just uplift Jesus. Mm. That's what this whole lesson and, of course, a study yes. of your word is all about. So be with our viewers. Draw each and every one of us, Lord, closer to you through a pr the process of this study. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we study the book of Mark, this first lesson is just called the beginning of the gospel. Let's do a bird's eye overview. If you look at the gospels, what are they about? In the gospels, we find Jesus. Mm -hmm. We find and experience Jesus. His perfect life of ministering, teaching, healing, loving, serving. We find his perfect substitutionary sacrifice on the cross, meeting the claims of the law, dying in our place. We find his resurrection and ascension to the right hand of the Father. In the Gospels, we find Jesus. Now, the first three Gospels, we call them the Synoptic Gospels. In Greek, that just means see together. This would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You look at the healings of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus through the lens of the different authors. And we get this comprehensive picture of the life and ministry of Jesus when he was on this earth. Now, the Gospel of John is a little different. It's a little more theological in nature, you could say. We have more of these discourses, and John tells some different stories that might not appear in those three synoptic gospels. When we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew would be considered the most Jewish of the gospels, if you want to call it that. Uh, it was written specifically more with the Jews in mind. You could say Luke would be maybe the most Gentile of the gospels, written specifically for the Gentiles. We discover in Mark, it's the first gospel that was written. It would be written more specifically with the Gentiles' mind as well. And Matthew and Luke would have drawn from the material of Mark. Mark, I would be what we called when we were in school, show and tell. You're not just going to sit and get a lecture. You're going to see action. You're going to see it demonstrated. And through that demonstration, we discover the life and character of Jesus Christ. The Gospel of John would have really been written for the second generation of believers. Scholars believe that it would be the last book written in the New Testament. And this book would have been those who had not experienced Jesus, had not walked this earth with Jesus. And here they are hearing secondhand, you could say, from those who had experienced Jesus when he walked and talked this earth. In the Gospel of Mark, we don't see really any introduction to Jesus Christ. There's no genealogy like 
like there is in Matthew. There's no discussion of his pre-incarnate state like we find in the Gospel of John. There's no story of his birth like we find in Matthew and Luke. In fact, the opening statement of the book of Mark simply assumes knowledge of who he is. Mark 1 verse 1. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Right there, we're just given plainly. Who is this about? This is about Jesus. And this Jesus is the Son of God. The Gospel of Mark focuses on this theme of suffering and Jesus going to the cross. It focuses on the great controversy, Jesus mm -hmm. being in battle against demonic forces, against forces of nature, against the religious leaders. We'll discover even his own family. We find this great controversy theme. And we'll discover as we study the Gospel of Mark that there's what they call a revelation and secrecy motif. When Jesus heals people, what does he say? Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody who I am. When he casts out demons, what does he say? Shh, keep quiet. And you would say, why would he want to keep that quiet? In scholarship, they actually call this the messianic secret. And we'll discover that in the Gospel of Mark, you get to the end, you have this powerful revelation of Jesus Christ. There's two major divisions of Mark, and we'll study as we go through this quarter. Chapters one through eight is all about who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And we discover Jesus in the miracles, in the teachings, mm -hmm. in the healings that take place. In fact, you get to the middle of Mark, Mark chapter eight. Peter says, remember Jesus had said, who do men say that I am? And Peter acknowledges, you are the Christ. So the beginning of Mark is all about who is Jesus. The end of Mark is all about where is he going? He's going to the cross. What's interesting is the Jewish leaders of those days, they thought he's going to break the oppressive Roman yoke and he's going to deliver the people. But that wasn't where he was going at all. He was going to the cross. It's interesting, if you look at the authorship of the Gospels, and I promise you I'm getting into my day, but the authorship of the Gospels, we have two of the Gospels written by apostles themselves. The other two Gospels written by people associated with apostles. So Matthew was an apostle, tax collector apostle. He wrote the book of Matthew. And John, remember James and John, the sons of thunder? John was an apostle. He wrote the book of John. But Mark and Luke were written by by companions of apostles. Luke, of course, the doctor physician who traveled with the apostle Paul. And Mark, we're gonna discover today, he did travel with the apostle Paul, but many people say he worked extensively later in life with the apostle Peter. Hmm. Um, Peter calls Mark his son in 1 Peter chapter five. And tradition, early tradition held that Mark was an interpreter for Peter. So when I read the Gospel of Mark, we know that John Mark wrote it, but it's interesting to me, you can almost see pre Peter's personality. You can see his impetuousness and his, there's a lot of the words immediately and you just jump right in there. This week, we just study who is John Mark. We look at his failure and his subsequent recovery and the opening section of the book of Mark. Our memory text is in Mark 1, 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. As we look at Sunday's lesson, we look at who is John Mark, and in my remaining moments, the title of Sunday is The Failed Missionary. So I wanna tell you, this lesson is for anybody who feels like they failed. If you have ever felt like you failed in your Christian walk or Christian experience, this lesson is to give us encouragement and hope in Jesus Christ. We first see mention of John Mark in Acts chapter 12. Remember, James was beheaded, Peter was arrested and put in prison, and the disciples held a prayer session for him. Lord, would you deliver him? And the angel of the Lord came, delivered Peter from prison. He walks out of the prison and he goes to the house of Mary, the woman they had gathered, they were praying there. Remember, he knocked on the door and Rhoda answered the door. We know this story. 
So who was that woman's house? We find that in Acts 12, 12. When he had considered this, this is Peter. He came to the house of Mary. This is when he came out of prison. The mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered there together. This is the first mention we see of John Mark. He's a young man. This would be the mid 40s, over 10 years after Jesus has been crucified and resurrected. Then we discover at the end of Acts chapter 12 that John Mark returns with Paul and Barnabas to Antioch. And from there they set sail in Acts chapter 13 on their first missionary journey. You can discover that the apostles were set apart by the laying on of hands and prayer. And they went on their first missionary journey. But what happened to John Mark? He got discouraged. He got out on this missionary journey. It was thousands of miles. It was a long journey. Over 1,200 miles was the journey. In Acts 13, 13, it says, Paul and his party set sail from Paphos. They came to Perga and Pamphylia. But John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. Acts of the Apostles, page 169. Mark, overwhelmed with fear and discouragement, wavered for his time and his purpose to give himself wholeheartedly to the Lord's work. Unused to hardships, he was disheartened by the perils and privations of the way. Now, Ryan's Day probably will get into the discussion this created between Paul and Barnabas and Paul saying, I don't even want to work with John Mark. And there was all these difficulties that occurred because Mark got discouraged. So what are your takeaways? if you feel like you have failed as a Christian. And I know I have been there and I have felt this way sometimes. Takeaway number one, failure is not final. Proverbs 24, verse 16, a just man falls seven times, but he gets up again. He rises up again. Failure is not final. That was not the end of the story of John Mark. Takeaway number two, failure does not define who you are. We discover later that John Mark actually reconciled with Paul and later was useful to him in the ministry. And we discover he also ministered with Peter and served with Peter. So that disappointment or discouragement, that time when John Mark got discouraged and left the work, that was not all there was to life. That was not the end of John Mark's experience. It did not have to define who he was. Number three, failure is a door. Look at failure as a learning opportunity. When I fail, it shows me my faults, my selfishness, my pride, my need to grow and to change. We can turn it inward and focus on ourselves or we can turn it outward. And number four, failure teaches dependence on Christ. When everything else is stripped away and you kind of stare yourself in the face, oh wow, God, is that really me? We turn to Jesus, recognize our full dependence on him and know he can turn failure into victory. Mm, amen. Thank you so much, Jill, for that powerful open. I'm Ryan Day. I have Monday's lesson entitled A Second Chance. And um, this lesson is really all about uh, discovering and looking into, um, you know, Mark's uh, interesting uh, exchange with Paul and Barnabas and what ultimately sent Paul and Barnabas in different directions uh, in terms of ministry. But uh, of course, uh, the lesson brings that out very clearly and we'll get into that. I want to jump right into Acts chapter 15 because the lesson actually has us reading verses 36 to 39. And the lesson opens up with the question of why did Paul reject John Mark and why did Barnabas give him a second chance? So um, I think those both of those are great questions to begin with. So we're going to read Acts chapter 15 and we're going to focus on verses 36 to 39. It says there, Then after some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of our Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. 
uh, the lesson brings out that the reason for Paul's rejection of the young man is given in Acts chapter 15, verse 38. Mark had uh, withdrawn from them and not continued in the work of ministry. And of course, the question is, as I'm studying through this, I kind of just sometimes like to just kind of somewhat not pretend, but just take myself and, and place myself. If I was there and I was observing this or involved in this, which side would I have chosen? Because again, it's not about choosing sides. Really, at the end of the day, we should never be so divisive that we choose sides. But at the same time, we're human. These were human beings. This is Barnabas and, 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 and Saul Paul, who clearly were absolutely uh, 100% involved in God's work and motivated to continue in ministry, but yet they came to a disagreement. And, and it's like, well, which, which one was in the right here? I think both. I think the answer is both. I think from Paul's perspective, he shows to us and teaches us a lesson that there are times in our ministry or times in our life when, you know what, you can't just uh, move forward and just accept any old person to be involved in a particular special work because that person and may not be ready for whatever reason or for what they're going through at that particular time in their life. Clearly, uh, Mark had been in a place in his mind where previous to this, he just wasn't ready. He showed that he's not, he wasn't there at that maturity level yet to take on the work that Paul was about to you know, embark on doing, which is going back and, and checking in and continuing that ministry at all the churches that he had uh, previously started. Uh, but of course, Barnabas, I think, was in the right because Barnabas is looking at this from more of a... Uh, uh, you know, potential, compassionate yeah. standpoint. Like this young man has potential. Let's not be so harsh. I mean, yeah, he made a mistake and yeah, he, he's not quite there yet, but, but, but we still should be able to bring him. And Paul was like, no, 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 not right now. And it ultimately led them to in this, this very, very strong disagreement. In fact, the scripture actually says that the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. They simply were brothers that didn't agree and it led them in opposite directions, but yet obviously in the same ministry. I just want to bring out the fact here in the lesson that this happens often sometimes in ministry and, and we try to avoid it, but sometimes the brethren can't see eye to eye on things. And um, uh, in, in the moment, especially the heated moment, things can be said or things can be done that will make things the brethren's kind of split or go in an opposite direction or say, you know what, I need a break or we need to, you go do your thing and I'll do my thing. The main thing is that we learn from a biblical perspective. We apply biblical principles here in working to do whatever we can to reconcile, to come together and to be sure that we're moving in the right direction, not with a, a spirit of hatred or not with a spirit of contention or division, but bring, bring together. Now there's a few biblical principles that I just want to bring out here because I know that there's many people that watch Sabbath school panel maybe that has never read the Bible or maybe they've, they've tuned in for the very first time and this is new information to them. I want to share with you just two or three texts of what the Bible teaches us about when we come together and sometimes we have a disagreement that leads to maybe a moment of contention. We should do all that we can to seek to reconcile to one another in those moments. We start, of course, with the counsel given in Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. This is, of course, coming straight from the mouth of Jesus. Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. Jesus says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two, two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And in verse 17, and if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So there's a process that Jesus says must be taken place when you run into these divisions where maybe there even is a situation where sin is involved and it's caused division or caused a, 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 a segmentation within the church. Uh, it's important that you go to that person personally, privately and address the issue. And if they won't listen, then you take an elder, a couple of elders, the pastor of the church, and you go and you address that situation. If they still won't listen, then Jesus says, now that you have to take it before the church. Uh, but, but of course, we don't, we don't want it to get to that way, right? Ephesians chapter, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. I love this counsel by Paul. Uh, and you can tell Paul's spirit here because I believe ultimately this is exactly what happened between Paul and Mark and, and, and even Barnabas. I think down the road there was some reconciliation involved. And it says here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And then, of course, Hebrews chapter 12 and, and verses 14 and 15. 
I'm reading from the ESV just because I love the way I believe the wording here was very, very much uh, in, in accordance and accurate according to what I've, I read in the original um, translations as well or the original manuscripts here. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15, it says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no one uh, that, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become offended. Uh, and that's so true. And I find that that's exactly what I believe Barnabas and Paul and all of them. Ultimately, they all, like I said, I think they, uh, this ultimately was the end result of them coming together and reconciling this down the road. But of course, Paul in the beginning, he saw the immaturity level, spiritual immaturity level that is. Not that, not that Mark was an immature person, but his spiritual immaturity level at that time, Paul was not, he didn't think it was uh, good to proceed with, with Mark in the group. And of course, Barnabas, he didn't see that, but yet he was erring on the side of grace and saying, no, 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 let's, this brother has potential. Let's move forward. And for a time, it did lead them to go in different directions. But praise the Lord, there's a happy ending to this story because scripture confirms not once, not twice, not three times, but four times in the aftermath of this incident, uh, we see that Mark, uh, there was reconciliation and Mark did grow and Mark was very much involved in the ministry uh, moving forward. Colossians chapter four and verse 10, for example, um, it says here that Aristarchus, Aristarchus, I guess that's how you would say it. My fellow prisoner greets you uh, with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, what? welcome him. So now does Paul have a different opinion of Mark than he did before? Absolutely. Paul knows that God has called Mark and that he's ready to minister now. Second Timothy chapter two and verse 11 says, only Luke is with me. This is again, Paul speaking. He says, get Mark and bring him with you. I love that. He says, for he is useful to me for ministry. So now of course, Paul has a different opinion about Mark. Um, even Philemon says in uh, Philemon verse 24, it says, um, and I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, Epaphras, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Jesus Christ, greets you as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow brethren. So again, this is scriptural evidence that Mark, of course, uh, grew and is, was very much used uh, in ministry as we obviously the whole point of this is that we were studying his book, right? That he wrote in the Gospels. And so 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3, which uh, uh, Jill referenced earlier, it says, She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so I think the lesson to learn from this is the title of this lesson, of course, is A Second Chance. Uh, you know, I believe that we should give people a second chance. Even though they may not be spiritually ready now does not mean that they will not be spiritually ready in the future. So we should be wise, seek the Lord in how to use people and how to work with people in ministry moving forward as Paul and Barnabas did with Mark. Thank you so much, Ryan. Beautifully done. Praise the Lord. He gives us all a second chance. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back to our study on the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. We pass it over to Miss Shelley Quinn. Oh, my joy. I have Tuesday's lesson, The Messenger. I'm Shelley Quinn for those who are listening in by radio. You know, what I like about Mark is he uses quite a bit of Old Testament uh, text and he blends in the very beginning of his gospel, he blends Exodus 23, 20, Isaiah 43, and Malachi 3, 1. And I thought we'd read those first and then you will recognize it when we get to Mark. So Exodus 23, 20, God says, Behold, I send an angel before you. Now, it is so important that we understand the word angel does not describe the nature of a being, but it describes that being's 
service mm -hmm. as a messenger for God. So we see in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word malak, and in the New Testament, angelos, they both are translated either as messenger or angel. They are both used and applied to ordinary human messengers, the prophets and the priests, but they also are both used to refer to heavenly messengers. Exodus 23, 20. Here we go again with this angel. Behold, I send an angel or a messenger before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. The messenger God sent before Israel to bring them into Canaan. Isaiah 40 in verse 3 says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for God. So there's many ties with the ministry of John the Baptist and this focus on preparing the way of the Lord. In the last Old Testament book of Malachi, the Lord prophesies of sending John the Baptist to announce his coming. Let's look at that one. I love it. Malachi 3.1. This is the Lord speaking and he says, Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way for me. Now, in this same passage, the Lord is going to immediately announce himself as the messenger of the covenant. So I'm going to send my messenger with a little mm -hmm. M. And he says, And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger, capital M, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And then if you jump down to verse five of Malachi, he says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So the Old Testament ends on this note and the New Testament simply picks up the narrative of the Old Testament. Mark is a very fast moving narrative. He is depicted the Messiah Christ, which both simply mean they're synonymous terms for the anointed king. Jesus, the covenant son of God, is on a journey to the cross to pay the penalty for our sin by standing in as our sacrificial substitute. And as Jill already said, the first half of Mark, Mark chapters 1 through 8, it's telling us who is Jesus. It's answering that question. But then the second half of Mark through the end of verse 16 or chapter 16 is telling us where Jesus is going. So the gospel of Mark is about the journey of Jesus mm -hmm. and it depicts John the Baptist, the messenger who prepares the way. Let's read that. Mark 1. Verses 1 through 4, Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the first character in this passage. The Son of God, so the Father is implied as the second character. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. We just got through reading about that in Malachi. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John, this is the Baptist, John the Baptist, the messenger, the preacher, who's the third character, came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So John's ministry recalls the ministry of Elijah. He's preaching repentance. He's turning people away from sin, turning their hearts 
back to the Lord, there had been 400 years of silence between Malachi and now the New Testament time. And so 400 years before God had prophesied, he would send Elijah to turn the hearts back to God. So here comes John the Baptist. He came from a priestly family and he is commissioned by God as the last old covenant priest or prophet, excuse me, the prophet. He was the Elijah to come. At least that's how Jesus identifies him in Matthew 11, 7 through 14 and Matthew 17, verses 9 through 13. So he came to herald the coming of humanity's Redeemer, crying out, make straight the path for Messiah's mission. Now, verse 5, Mark 1 and verse 5. Then all, now that is hyperbole, it's exaggerated, not literal. All the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Verse 6, now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. So he is clothed like the ancient prophet Elijah the Tishbite. Second Kings 1 8 says Elisha was a hairy man with a girdle of leather about his loins. And then verse 7 of Mark chapter 1, verse 7 says, And he preached, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandals strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. To loosen the strap of the sandal, this was a menial task. It was the task of a slave. And I love it because what we see here is John's humility is vividly on display. He's saying, you know what? Yeah, Jesus is going to call me the greatest of all prophets, but I'm not even worthy to step down, mm -hmm. stoop down and untie his, his sandals. So John understands who Jesus is, the exalted position. And then he says in verse 8, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I want to read a very important scripture. I love this passage. It's talking about the renewal, the regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. This comes from Titus chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, and I'm going to read from the Amplified Version. He, Jesus, saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but because of his own pity and mercy. How did he save us? By the cleansing bath of the new birth, that's regeneration, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit's in you, you become a new creation, which he poured out so richly upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And he did it in order that we might be justified, declared not guilty by his grace, by his favor that was undeserved that we might be acknowledged and counted as conformed to the divine will in purpose, thought, and action, and that we might become heirs of the eternal life uh, according to our hope. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Shelley. I've got Wednesday's lesson. I'm Daniel Perrin, and uh, Wednesday's lesson is titled Jesus Baptism. And we're going to start by looking at the text in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 13. I'm going to read that straight through so it's fresh in our minds as we think together. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. 
Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Immediately, the spirit drove him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. Now, sometimes you will hear a long gushing introduction of a speaker, which sometimes would be, would be better set aside and just say, let the speaker speak for himself and introduce him onto the stage. Well, Mark does one of those very brief but powerful introductions with a major buildup. Right off the bat in Mark 1, we have scripture being used saying the Bible has pointed to a mighty forerunner. And then we immediately transition into the forerunner appears. And this would be the opening act. And the crowds are coming in to see the opening act of this forerunner who's been predicted. And the forerunner then says, someone else who is mighty and worthy is coming and he will baptize you with the spirit and with fire. And so now we're ready for it. The stage is set. The crowds are there. The forerunner who's predicted is on the scene, on the stage. And he says, a mighty, worthy one is coming. He's going to baptize. Are you ready for this? And so we get the first glimpse here of that mighty, worthy person who is going to baptize with the spirit and with fire. And he's ushered in as the fulfillment of scripture. And here is what we see. He is baptized like us. He hears the words from heaven that he has to trust implicitly like us. He is led by and obeys the prompting of the Holy Spirit, like us. He is tempted, like us. And finally, he is ministered to by angels, like us. This is not what they were expecting. This is the picture of a mighty and worthy God who humbles himself and becomes like us. And I love that you talked about John as a man of humility and Jesus humbles himself and lets John baptize him. And I want you to hear what, uh, what is written. It's in chapter 71 of the book, Desire of Ages, a chapter called A Servant of Servants. And listen to this on page 650, paragraph one. Uh, paraphrasing the words and an expression of Jesus here, Ellen White writes, in my kingdom, the principle of preference and supremacy has no place. The only greatness, think about this, the only greatness is the greatness of humility. The only distinction is found in devotion to the service of others. And so our first glimpse of the mighty worthy one is humbling himself to serve us and become one with us. Let's take those things one at a time fairly briefly here. He is baptized, not because of any uncleanness in himself that needed to be washed away, but he sets an example. Mark describes him blazing the trail for us. If a teacher gives an assignment to the students that the teacher cannot complete himself or herself, well, what does that say to the students? Jesus does not set us on a path that he has not already trod. And as a note here, Jesus has, in his baptism, we see he has a physical body that gets wet. In other words, he came with the same kind of body that we have. He's going to go through the things that we go through. Now, he hears God's voice. Uh, the Bible says here, Mark says that the heavens were broken apart. The word there is schizo, like schism, ripped apart. And he, he sees into heaven, not with his uh, physical eyes, but by hearing the voice of God. He hears the voice of the Father giving the plan. And he sees into heaven itself through the words of God. Now, do we have to do that same thing? Absolutely. We are called, as Jesus did, to trust implicitly in the words of Scripture. It's prophecies, it's promises, it's teachings that are sometimes unpopular. It's clear commands that go against our human nature that we are to put our faith in those words of God. And in order to do that, we have to read them. Every single one of us, not by proxy, not somebody else delivering to us what we've heard. We've got to hear those words. 
And then he is led by and obeys the Holy Spirit. That's what we are called to do. The Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus and we know here that Jesus follows the promptings of the Holy Spirit in his thoughts. And we know that because the Bible, Mark here in each of the gospels do not describe other people witnessing the dove. Jesus witnesses it. And Jesus hears that prompting voice. Of course, this dove is a symbol of purity and peace. And the people saw that purity and peace on Jesus' face as he is following the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And this then is going to be true of all followers of Jesus. They will hear and respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And others will see in them that purity and peace of what it's like to follow the path that God has laid out to you. And by doing so, then the skies will be open to us. The heavens will be open. We will see God's plan for us and have opportunity to follow it. Next, he is tempted like us. And I want to focus here for just a moment. His first official act uh, after his baptism is to face the deceiver face to face. Now, his first public act we're going to see when we study next week's lesson is that he's going to cast Satan out. All right, we'll study that next week. Mark does not list the specific temptations as we read about in Luke and Matthew. Mark simply says he was tempted. But oh, that one word there, those, that phrase says a lot. He receives Satan's full attention and his complete tactics. Satan goes all out because his kingdom is totally 100% on the line here. And so this is not some exhibition sparring with a predetermined outcome, not a polite game of checkers. There is a real Satan, a real enemy with real weapons and real strength. And we don't want to fall into either one of these uh, problems on, on the one hand saying uh, Satan's not really real and painting him just as a fairy tale creature. On the other hand, we don't want to exalt his power and think about how, how terribly strong Satan is when we should be looking at the mighty one, Jesus, who's victorious over temptation. I want you to see here that Jesus for 40 days allows himself to be tempted. He does not turn away from it. Now he did not resist, sorry, he did resist temptation, but he did not resist being tempted. I mean, there's a temptation. He could have destroyed Satan right away. Mm -hmm. But just like 1 John 3, 8 says, it says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy, not the devil, yet the works of the devil to be victorious over them. Now, I want to I also pause and remind those of you who've been baptized recently or who will be baptized. Baptism to express your faith and trust in Jesus does not free you from temptation. Mm -hmm. And temptation is not a sin. In fact, the, temp the same temptations that were uh, leveled against you before are going to come back, perhaps even stronger. And you might feel discouragement and you might feel like the, the failed missionary. You might feel like I'm, I'm not doing very well. Don't give up. Jesus was tempted like you. In fact, uh, God allows you to be tempted so that you can put your faith in Jesus. Listen to Hebrews 2, 18. This is a beautiful promise. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, here it is, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So all of this uh, shows us some key things about Jesus that then become a promise for us. I want to highlight Desire of Ages, page 123, paragraph 3. Listen to these words. Jesus did not consent to sin. Not even by a thought did he yield to temptation. So it may be with us. Christ's humanity was united with divinity. He was fitted for the conflict by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he came to make us partakers of the divine nature. Amen. What a powerful promise. So long as we are united to him by faith, sin has no more dominion over us. God reaches for the hand of faith in us to direct it to lay fast hold upon the divinity of Christ that we may attain to perfection of character. We, we can follow in the path he leads. Now the angels came and ministered to him when he was done being tempted, but we have angels helping us through temptation along with the power of the Holy Spirit and the words of the Father. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. I, I've got Thursday's lesson. My name is Pastor James Rafferty and I've got the gospel according to Jesus. It's actually Thursday, July 4. 
which is Independence Day for us here in America. We celebrate this as a day of liberty and freedom from colonialism back in 1776, July 4. Mark's Gospel, according to the quarterly, Mark's Gospel shortened to the point, verses 14 and 15, talk about the uh, proclamation of this gospel of the kingdom. I want us to look at this in relationship to Luke's gospel, uh, Luke chapter 4, and let's look here at, in Luke chapter 4, at verses 19 and uh, 20, I believe it is, or 18 and 19. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Uh, Luke says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I love this because when you look at the Gospel of Mark, as we pointed out already, it's very brief, it's very to the point, it's very, and there's something about that that's really appealing to a lot of people. I know a lot of pastors, a lot of people that really love the Gospel of Mark. It's short and to the point. But we always want to compare Mark and John and Luke and Matthew and get a broader picture here. Luke's Gospel, uh, verse 14 of chapter 1 says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came unto Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom and saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. That's great. That's a, that's a nice, concise version of the gospel. But Luke expands it and makes it clear that God has come to set us free, to give us liberty. We were made in the image of God, and that image includes this desire for us to be free, to be free in our choices, and that's what got us in trouble in the first place, according to Genesis chapter 3. But God has come through Jesus Christ to restore that freedom, that, that choice, so that now we can choose to actually be restored to God's image, to have the Spirit of God within us that gives us that liberty and that freedom, but to put that liberty and freedom on the side of God. And this gospel, according to Mark, has, now we're just looking at the quarterly now, has three basic categories. It's a time prophecy, it's a covenant promise, and it's a call to discipleship. The time is fulfilled is the time prophecy. The kingdom of God is near is the covenant promise, that kingdom of God being near in Jesus Christ. And then the call to discipleship is the call to repent and believe the gospel. Now the time prophecy to which Jesus refers is the 70 week prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 27. And I really appreciate actually getting this lesson, Shelley. He gave me the right lesson because it's referring to the 70 week prophecy and it's something that I think is really important for us to understand, but it's been misunderstood by so many believers. Uh, the 70 week prophecy that's found in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, uh, refers to the coming of Christ, his anointing, his crucifixion, and then the close of this 70 weeks with the stoning of Stephen in AD 34. And a lot of believers, a lot of Christians actually take the last week of that prophecy. They, they apply the 69 weeks, but they take the 70th week and they throw it way off into the future and they apply it to the Antichrist. Now we really can't do this, but even some Adventists down the road, and I'm thinking of people like uh, Desmond Ford, have undermined this prophecy. You know, they've, mm -hmm. the, the, we've been accused of um, uh, applying 1844 to a kind of a face-saving uh, idea, and that is, is that, well, you know, we thought Jesus was going to come, Jesus didn't come, and so we switched it now. Instead of him coming to earth, he's moved into the most holy place mm -hmm. of the heavenly sanctuary. And that idea has, for a lot of people, undermined the whole point of the 2300 day prophecy, which begins with a 70 week prophecy. And I think what God has done for us in these last days specifically is, is he has helped us to understand the 70 week prophecy, not just from the Old Testament, but also from the New Testament. And what do I mean by that? Well, the word in, in uh, Daniel chapter nine, the word for uh, Jesus, is Messiah, Messiah the Prince. Now that word Messiah means the anointed one, the anointed one. And if you look at uh, the New Testament word for anointed one, it's Christ. So in the Old Testament is Messiah in the Hebrew. In the New Testament, it's Christ. That means the anointed one, Jesus Christ, Jesus the anointed one, Messiah the Prince, the anointing of the Prince. Daniel gives us this 70 week prophecy 
And in the context of that prophecy, we're told that there would be 483 years, that's 483 days, day for a year, 483 years until the anointing of the Messiah. And then if you look in the book of Luke, you find in Luke chapter 10 and verse 38 that God specifically anoints Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil and God was with him. That's Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. So Mark is talking about the gospel being proclaimed. Luke is talking about this gospel being a gospel of liberty. Acts 10, 38. What did I say? Luke. Luke. Luke 10, 38. Acts 10, 38. Acts Thank 10, 38. Okay, Thank you. I was trying to All find right. it. Got it. Yes, got it. <laughs> okay. Acts 10, 38. So Mark is talking about the gospel being proclaimed, the time being fulfilled. There's a time element here. Luke talks about this gospel being a gospel of liberty and freedom. Daniel identifies in Daniel chapter 9, Messiah, the anointing, the anointing of the prince, Messiah. And in the New Testament, we find that that same anointing is described as Christ, Jesus Christ. If you look here then in the context of, of Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, the anointing of Christ took place at his baptism. Now, if you go back to the gospel of Luke, and you start in verse two, you have in verse two, the timetable for Christ's birth, right? He's born under Augustus Caesar. If you go to chapter three, you have the timetable for his anointing. He's anointed, that is the fulfillment of Christ or Messiah takes place in Acts chap or excuse me, in Luke chapter three, in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, and that is Luke chapter three, verse one. In the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, uh, this is when everyone's going to the Jordan and being baptized. Jesus goes to the Jordan also to be baptized. And after he's baptized, according to verse 22 of Luke chapter three, the Holy Ghost comes upon him in bodily shape like a dove. And the voice comes from heaven, which says, thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So this is really powerful because what you have here in Luke's historical account is the confirmation of what Mark is saying in Mark chapter one, the time is fulfilled. This is a specific time prophecy. In fact, that word time often means set or appointed time. It's talking about a specific time that God has set in his word. This time that's being fulfilled is the very time that Daniel talks about in Daniel chapter nine. It's the time when Messiah, when Christ, when the anointing would take place of Jesus Christ. And that took place in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Now, there are actually five Google references. Uh, Ryan, you mentioned Google earlier. There's five Google references that we have that you can look up and you can find that the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar is going to lead you to 27 AD. 27 AD would be the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And when you start in 27 AD and you work backwards, you're going to find that the 483 day for a year prophecy, the 483 or the 69 weeks that were predicted, it would be 69 weeks till Messiah would be anointed, or excuse me, till Christ would be anointed, till the Prince would be anointed to Messiah, the, the Prince, or to the anointing of Jesus uh, as Christ. The 69 weeks of the 483 years would begin in 457 and take us to 8027. If you start in 8027, you can actually walk that back 483 years. So instead of going from 457, the date of Artaxerxes uh, to let God's people go forth to rebuild Jerusalem, etc., you can actually go forward to the predicted in Daniel chapter nine, anointing of Christ with the Holy Spirit, you can go to AD 27 and from AD 27, which is a provable date from both the scriptures, Luke chapter three, and from history, Google statements, you can walk back 483 years and from 27 AD, you can walk all the way back to guess what date? 457 BC. So now what God is doing is he's saying, this 70 week prophecy is so important and this is what uh, my lesson is talking about primarily. The focus of this lesson, of course, is the decree of Artaxerxes in uh, Ezra chapter seven, but I wanted to add to that. I wanna make sure that you folks know that we can not only prove this date from the Old Testament going forward, but we can now prove this date from the New Testament going backwards. And if you'd like to have more information about this, we have a little booklet 
uh, that we uh, make available here at 3ABN. It's called Messiah, and it has all the information, all the dates in it to help us to understand how solid this Bible prophecy is. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor James. I love that, walking backwards as well as walking forward with that time prophecy. Thank you, Pastor James and Daniel and Shelley and Ryan for your study of the Word. As we study the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, I want to give each one of you a moment to share some final thoughts. Ryan, we'll start with you. Amen. I want to just reiterate uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. It says, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Amen. I'm just thinking about the messenger of the covenant who came, humbled himself, and died in our place. He came to satisfy his own justice. The penalty of sin is death. He paid that penalty for me. He paid that penalty for you. Amen. I just want to encourage once again, those of you who have been recently baptized or you will be soon, probably the best habit, one of the best habits that you can uh, engage in is to fortify your mind daily with the words of God. Really set apart that time. It's so, so essential to, to put those promises and those commands and just the whole presence of, of, of God through his word and the Holy Spirit helps that word to dwell in our lives. And if you have a friend or a, a member of your church or someone you know who has has been recently baptized, be, be one of those messengers, right, who is an encourager to them because temptation doesn't stop when you get baptized, but God will promise to help you. Amen. Amen. The quarterly brings out that uh, the question, when was the last time you studied the 70 week prophecy and how can knowing this prophecy help increase your faith, not only in Jesus, but in the trustworthiness of the prophetic word? So I'd like to encourage you, get a copy of this book, uh, get into the Word of God and specifically study the 70 week prophecy because I believe that the time in which we live makes this prophecy vital. Oh yes, it applied to Christ, it was fulfilled in Christ, but there's that last week that not many people are sure about in our Christian community and we need to be there to help them to understand the application of this prophecy to Jesus Christ, its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. The Gospels are all about Jesus. We're going to just study that and continue studying that for the rest of this quarter. I'm excited about this. We've looked at Mark um, as he failed and as he was reconciled um, back to the brethren. We looked at his authorship. We looked at Jesus being baptized and called and that fulfillment of those 69 weeks, the beginning of his earthly ministry, those three and a half years on this earth. Next week, we look at a day in the ministry of Jesus. This is Jesus stepping into Capernaum there, calling his disciples and then stepping in Capernaum. And we discover what is a day in the ministry of Jesus like. Join us next week to find that out.